Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Daniel Hahn, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Oxford Assembly of God Church, and this is our podcast. And I just want to thank you for listening today. We hope the message you're about to hear inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you see that God has a purpose for your life. And now, let's get into the message. Good morning. It is so good to be with you. Uh, as Pastor share with you, my name is, is Rich Freeman. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Anybody here from Brooklyn? Queens, that doesn't count. I met my wife in Astoria. Um, so let's get this out of the way. How many of you are thinking, that's the biggest Jewish person I've ever seen in my life? I get that a lot. What, what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, we call it Messiah in the Passover. But what I try to do is take the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples and the traditional Jewish Passover, which is celebrated every year, and show you how they are connected, so importantly connected. And I want to begin by uh, asking you a question. How many of you uh, are familiar with the painting, The Last Supper by Da Vinci? Anybody have it in an important place in your house so I know who to apologize to later? <laughs> it's a beautiful work of art. Uh, da Vinci was amazing. However, it's not quite biblically accurate. It's the depiction of The Last Supper from the perspective of an Italian Catholic living in the 15th century. So what Da Vinci does is not only does he bring some of his Catholic theology in the painting, uh, but he also incorporates some of his Italian culture. And uh, let me share with you. So they're all seated on chairs. And obviously Jesus is going to be in the middle. And uh, they look like they're posing for a picture, which they were. And they're all very Italian looking. Uh, in, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, in Brooklyn, you were either Jewish or Italian and so many of my Italian friends had a very Italian painting of Jesus in their house. He kind of resembled Al Pacino in the movie Serpico. <laughs> you know the painting I'm talking about. So they're all around Jesus, and they're all very Italian looking, uh, except for one. He was next to Jesus, kind of looking up at Jesus like he was up to no good, had little beady eyes, an exaggerated big nose. Who was that? That was Judas, the Jewish disciple. <laughs> but as you may be aware, they were all Jews. Jesus was Jewish, and this was a Jewish Passover that they were about to celebrate. Da Vinci actually painted behind Jesus a window, and that window showed daylight. And we're going to see later on, Paul writes, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Uh, the Jewish day always begins at sunset the night before. And so uh, the fact that da Vinci painted daylight uh, was because he was Italian, and Italians have their big meal of the day at midday. And so he painted it as though it was sort of the last lunch instead of the last supper. And in the process of doing that, he thought, well, if it's daylight, it must be Friday, which means it would have been Good Friday, and... Catholics don't eat meat on Good Friday. So what do you suppose da Vinci painted as the main course? It was actually eel, but uh, it was the famous Passover eel that uh, you read about in the scriptures. <laughs> but they would have actually had lamb, obviously, uh, as, their, as their main course. And so uh, on the table next to the eel, uh, da Vinci painted little loaves of Italian bread, even though uh, leaven was totally forbidden for eight days. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so it didn't matter to da Vinci. I mean, these were Italians having a meal. What do Italians have with their meal but Italian bread, right? And so da Vinci did that. But let's talk about what this actually looked like. The table was called a triclinium, a three-sided table. Try to imagine two short sides, one long side. And this very first spot would have been situated closest to the door so that the host could greet his guests. And obviously at the Last Supper, Jesus was the host. 
But we'll see from scripture that Jesus wasn't the first spot. It was actually John. Next to John was Jesus. And I actually think next to Jesus was Judas. And I'll show you from scripture why I believe that. We don't know the others, but the very last spot opposite where John was, was Peter. And again, I'll show you from the scriptures why I believe that. But they're on the floor reclining, which changes our view of, a, of an important event that took place in the Last Supper. On the table would have been a bowl of water. And the water was there so that everybody could wash their hands according to the law of Moses. But Jesus did something different at the Last Supper. What did Jesus do? He washed their feet. And because of da Vinci's painting, we sort of have a visual of Jesus maybe kneeling down and they're sticking their foot up uh, you know, a little bit so that so he could reach it. But that's not how it was. They were on the floor reclining. Uh, they, they basically would have had their left elbow in feet sticking straight out, eating with their right hand, so that you understand at the time of Jesus there were no left-handed people. <laughs> left-handed people were considered odd and strange. And so the parents would have tried to change them. So let me see how many lefties we have in the audience. Let's see. So you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. No, just kidding. But they were on the floor, which is very important because what Jesus would have done he would have girded himself with a towel, wrapped it around his waist, got down on his hands and knees, taking on the role of the lowest house slave and going around the table, washing everybody's feet. And as he did that, he gave us a new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I've loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples when you have loved one for another, teaching us about self-sacrificial love. And... I've studied the Last Supper for many years, and I believe the foot washing takes place early enough that it's very likely Jesus washed Judas' feet. Now, we usually don't think about that, but imagine Judas now is set. He's already been paid. He's planning to betray Jesus. And now there's his master on his hands and knees, washing his feet, and the two of them make eye contact. Judas had to have been a tormented soul that night as he was preparing to betray his master. So again, they're on the floor reclining, and that'll come into play as we look uh, later on at, at the biblical uh, scriptures. So we're gonna go through all of these elements. These are elements that are uh, on every table at a Jewish Passover. We've just passed Passover. It was in uh, mid-April, and uh, we're gonna go through these elements now. Somebody thinks that's funny, huh? <laughs> well, we're gonna try new, new uh, matches, let's see. There you go, you could applause, that's all right. If I wasn't, didn't have my hands tied, I'd be applauding too. <laughs> so, there's some traditional prayers that will be prayed throughout the, the course of the presentation, and I'll pray in Hebrew and translate it for you into English. And the traditional prayer for the lighting of the candles, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kidshanu b'mitzvotzav ve'tzivanu lahadlik ner shel Pesach. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us and commanded us concerning the lighting of the Passover lights. And as these candles burn, let it be a reminder to you that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And for us as his followers, we should be lights wherever we go, even like a dark place like Central Florida. Amen? <laughs> so that's the lighting of the candles. In front of me are four cups of grape juice, they would have taken one cup, taken it four times, but we do it this way so you understand each time the cup is taken, it has different significance and meaning. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. The cup of sanctification. The word to sanctify means to set apart, to make holy. It's what begins the meal. The second cup is called the cup of judgment. The cup of judgment, a reminder of God's judgment in the form of the 10 plagues upon Egypt. The third cup, takes place after supper. Passover is actually in three parts, a longer ceremonial part, 
then a full meal, and then a shorter ceremony. And I don't know if they've told you, but we're going to be having a meal. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, but the third cup takes place after supper. It's very important. It's a key element in the Passover. And I'm going to quiz you on this later, so you better remember. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. Cup of redemption. And the fourth cup is taken at the very end of the meal. And the fourth cup has a promise attached to it from Exodus 6. That promise, I will take you to be my people. It's called the cup of praise. So first cup, cup of sanctification, cup of judgment, cup of redemption, cup of praise. I'm going to take the first cup, and there's a traditional prayer that would have been prayed, and that prayer is Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Puri HaGofen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the creator of the fruit of the vine. Everybody say amen. amen. And we take the first cup. This is called a Seder plate. Seder plates can be very expensive. China made in Israel that costs thousands of dollars. I've done this where the children's Sunday school class makes one out of styrofoam, and they both work. <laughs> it's a matter of just holding all the elements that are going to be taken. And the first element that we're going to look at is some sprigs of parsley. The parsley represents something called the hyssop plant. The hyssop plant was very important to the Israelites in that it was used to place the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their houses. If you remember the story of Passover, the children of Israel are told that the angel of death, the destroyer, is coming, uh, and if there is no blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their houses, the firstborn in that house will die. Only when the, the, the house is covered by the blood, in effect. When the angel of death sees the blood, what will he do? He'll pass over that house, and that's where the name Passover comes from. So Passover is a picture of salvation by the blood of the lamb. Only those who personally apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts of their houses would be saved from that last plague, which was the death of the firstborn. Now, how many of you have seen the movie The Ten Commandments? Probably more than once. The one I'm talking about, the one with Charlton Heston. Well, in that movie, there's a scene where the actor John Derrick, who plays Joshua, is carrying this bucket of blood under his arm. With, he has a stick and a little rag attached to the stick. And he goes to his girlfriend's house. She just saved his life by being willing to move in with the bad guy played by Edward G. Robinson. You don't remember that? Try finding that in the Bible. <laughs> anyway, there's a scene where you see him with this stick painting on the blood on the door. Everybody remember that? It's not how, quite how it was in the scriptures. So I want to read from Exodus chapter 12, the story of the first Passover, if you want to follow along. God says to uh, Moses and Aaron, speak to, the, to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th of this month, <clears throat> this is talking about the Hebrew month of Nisan, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. So how many households are we talking about? Well, when they left Egypt and were in the wilderness, Moses counted the fighting men. These are adult males, 20 years old and older, and he counted over 600,000 fighting men. So if we estimate conservatively that they had a wife and a couple of children, then it's very likely that the Israelites who left Egypt in the Exodus were a couple of million people. That being said, we're talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lambs. One of the things that I, I think we don't see quite clearly is the fact that God miraculously provided for the, for the Israelites, even beginning uh, with all of these lambs that, that had to be provided. And so let's read the chapter. So on the, tenth of each, on the 10th of this month, the Hebrew month of Nisan, they each want to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. So these thousands upon thousands of lambs would be selected on the day before. 
which would have been the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Nisan. On the ninth day of Nisan, Jesus entered Jerusalem and declared himself to be the King Messiah by riding on the colt of a donkey. So selection day was when Jesus entered Jerusalem. The lamb would then be selected. So once the lamb is selected, it's brought into the house. So try to imagine, the door opens up and in walks Papa. It's dark, maybe a candle burning. In walks Papa, leading a little lamb by the rope around its neck. And the house has a lot of kids. What are the kids gonna do? The kids are gonna play with it, they're gonna adopt it, it's gonna become part of the family. Let's give it a name, we'll call it Fluffy. And so the kids are playing with Fluffy and Fluffy's gonna become part of the family. But the papas get real serious because you see, the papas have to make sure that the lamb is everything that it's supposed to be. And so for four days, the papas are watching very carefully. Let's keep reading. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them according to what each man should eat, you were to divide the lambs. So they didn't want any single people. They wanted the lambs to be part of a community because this is really picturing something that would happen the last week of Jesus' life. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, four days later, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Now, think about this. We're talking about thousands and thousands of lambs. Don't you think that it should have said kill them at twilight? That would have made more sense considering there were so many lambs, but it says kill it. Because what would happen is all the lambs would be killed at exactly the same moment because the whole point is they are representative of a future lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so the assembly kills it at twilight. Now, turn to verse 22 if you're following along. And here's the way the, the blood of the lamb. Now, after the lamb is killed by cutting its throat, the blood of the lamb is captured and placed at the bottom of the door frame. Listen carefully. This is verse 22 of Exodus 12. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, that's what the parsley represents, dip it in the blood which is in the basin, so it's on the bottom of the door frame. apply some of the blood in the basin to the lintel, that's the top, and then to the two doorposts. So follow what they did. Dip it in the bottom, put it on the top, and the two sides. And what did I do? Made a cross. So the children of Israel were not only given the means of their salvation, they would be saved from that last plague by the blood of the lamb, but they were also shown the fulfillment of their salvation. Because when Jesus hung on that bloody Roman cross, he was the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was our Passover. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. So that's what the parsley represents. Next to the parsley is some salted water. Salted water represents two things. First, it represents the tears that the children of Israel cried out to God as slaves in Egypt. If you've ever tasted your tears, your tears are salty. But it also represents a great miracle that happened at the Red Sea, which is a salt sea. What's that great miracle? It was parted. And again, because of the movie, The Ten Commandments, we have a view of that, that the parting was just a little bit wide and about 25 across part of the sea. But if we're talking about a couple of million people who crossed overnight, in order for that many people to cross in that short a period of time, the parting had to be miles across. God literally removed the sea from in front of the Israelites they crossed the sea on dry ground, got to the other side. The army of Pharaoh chased in after them. But before they could catch them, the walls of water came and wiped out what was the strongest army at the time. Now, getting back to how this points to Jesus, what the papas would do on the 14th, just before 
twilight as they make a pronouncement. The lamb is worthy to be slain. So if Jesus entered Jerusalem on selection day, that night would have been the 10th of Nisan when the lamb enters the community. For four days, that lamb is carefully watched to make sure that it's everything it's supposed to be. And you could look at the different gospel accounts of all the questions that Jesus was asked that last week. The head of the community was the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. He was the one with the final say, and he made a pronouncement. He said, I find no fault with this man. The lamb was worthy to be slain. And Jesus died on Passover, just like the first Passover lamb. So what happens next is the parsley is dipped in the salted water and there's a prayer. And the prayer is, Baruch HaTah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Puri HaAdama. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the creator of the fruit of the earth. And then everybody would eat it. Then they would open up a bottle of water <laughs> and wash it down. Parsley tends to stick in the back of your throat. So for this next element, I want to come out here and make sure you could all see this. Everybody see this? This is called a matzatash, matzatash. Matzatash simply means matzah pocket. But what's unusual about it is that there are three compartments. One, two, three. And in each compartment is a board of matzah, a board of unleavened bread. Now, leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible. So matzah is unleavened bread is a picture of sinlessness. And this is a three-in-one matzotash. It's a three-in-one unity. And uh, does that remind you of anything? We actually sang about it earlier in worship. God is a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in a moment, you're going to see that this is intended to be a picture of the Godhead. However, in a traditional Jewish Passover, the explanation would be different. They would say that this represents the patriarchs. The patriarchs from the book of Genesis are three patriarchs. They are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, three patriarchs, one matzotash. And maybe you're thinking, I guess it's a plausible explanation. But I want you to notice what happens next. Next, I have to wipe the sweat off my brow. But the middle piece is taken out, the second of the three and one. I want you to notice some things about the matzah. First of all, can you see the holes? The matzah is pierced. Now, this is made with machine, but if you went online and you said, I want to make matzah at home, they would tell you to take water and flour, make a dough out of that, no yeast at all, and then take a fork and pierce it because as it bakes, you want to make sure it stays flat like a cracker and doesn't rise up because even without yeast, it would rise up almost like a pita bread, something like that, which you don't want. So it's pierced, and then as it's baked, it'll bubble a little bit. And if you notice, there are these colorations that almost look like stripes. I'm going to read a prophecy from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah who wrote it about seven centuries before Jesus went to the cross. He said, he was pierced through for our transgressions. This is from Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This piece of unleavened bread, the second of the three in one that's striped and pierced, clearly is intended to be a picture of Jesus. And what happens next, I think, confirms it. It's broken. One piece is left out. And the other piece is wrapped in a linen cloth. Sort of like a burial cloth. And then it's hidden away, buried, and it will be brought back after the supper for everyone to partake of. 
And that is the piece of bread that Jesus is going to take and use in describing himself when he says, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's the afikomen. The afikomen is said to mean the bread of affliction and Isaiah in his prophecy writes about the fact that the one who would be the Messiah would be also the afflicted one. So that's the afikomen. We're up to the second cup. Second cup is the cup of judgment, the cup of judgment, a reminder of God's judgment in the form of the 10 plagues upon Egypt. And as God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, do you remember what he, he told Moses to tell Pharaoh? Anybody remember? Let my people go. Pharaoh refused. God brought a plague upon the Egyptians. The first plague was turning the Nile River into blood. Pharaoh told Moses, if you take the plague away, we'll let the people go. Moses prayed to God. The plague stopped. Pharaoh changed his mind. It happens 10 times in that story. But within that biblical narrative, we also read God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God used that moment to bring glory to himself because all of these plagues against the Egyptians were plagues against the gods of the Egyptians. The Egyptians were very religious people. They, were, they worshiped lots of gods, beginning with the Nile River that they worshiped as a god and all those other plagues, the frogs and the flies. All those other plagues were against the gods of the Egyptians. And the last two plagues were against the chief god of the Egyptians who was their sun god named Ra. And Ra was known by two titles. First, he was known as the god of light. Next to the last plague was total darkness. And he was also known as the god of life. And the last plague, the death of the firstborn. So that when those plagues took place, the Egyptians understood the lesson that the God of Israel was the one true almighty God. They were so afraid of the Israelites that not only did they let them go, they paid them to go. They left with the treasury of Egypt, which fulfilled the prophecy that God gave to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15. Your descendants will be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years, and then they will be delivered with many possessions. So that's what we remember with the second cup and the prayer once again, Baruch HaTah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri Hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the creator of the fruit of the vine. Everybody say amen. amen. So if you're following along, I'm going to be reading from John chapter 13 which is John's account of the Last Supper. Beginning in verse, the end of verse 21, Jesus makes a statement. Now John had a particular writing style where he would add parenthetical statements to, to add certain information. And throughout his gospel, he talks about Judas as the one who would betray. But here, he doesn't do that. Instead, we read, the end of verse 21, Jesus makes this statement, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And you almost expected John to write, of course, he was referring to Judas, but he doesn't do that. Instead, we read next, the, the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of whom he was speaking. And so they couldn't imagine any one of the 12 betraying Jesus. And then we read this. Now, if if the scene was, as da Vinci painted it, this would be a weird looking scene. There was reclining on Jesus' chest or breast, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So John in his gospel refers to himself in that way. So this is John and he's leaning against Jesus' chest. Now in a chair, that would look kind of weird. And if you're not a couple, I wouldn't advise you to do that. But if they were on the floor, basically John is now getting tired and he's leaning back against his friend Jesus to kind of brace himself. And the person with the best view is over there. That's Peter. And so we read next, Simon Peter, this is verse 24 of John 13, therefore gestured to him, said to him, Tell us who it is. 
of whom he's speaking. So Peter's asking John to find out who the betrayer is. Why does he want to do that? Because Peter's thinking, if there's going to be a betrayal, I need to find out who it is. And if I find out who it is, I'm going to stop it. And if I have to, I'll kill that guy. Do you think Peter's capable of that? Well, later on, when they come to take him away, what happens to the synagogue official's slave? He cuts off his ear. I think he was trying to cut his head off and missed. That being said, he's doing these gestures to John. John figures out what, what Peter is saying and turns to Jesus and says, it says, he leaning back on Jesus' breast said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus looks at John and says, what's wrong with you people? Haven't you figured it out yet? That is Judas. No, he doesn't say that. He said, this is the one, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. Now, the unleavened bread during the Passover is dipped two times, one in bitter, one in sweet. Here, Jesus is about to reveal that someone that he loved and trusted was about to betray him. And that betrayal was going to cause him to die a horrible, torturous death at the hands of the Romans. What do you suppose he would use as an object lesson to help us remember, the bitter or the sweet? The bitter, of course. So he takes a piece of bread, dips it in the bitter mixture, and on the Seder plate here, it's represented by horseradish. And we read this. So, he so when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. What does that imply? Didn't say he got up and gave it to him. It says he took and gave it to him, implying that Judas was right next to him. And so would have understood and would have heard Jesus say that the betrayer is the one for whom he will dip the morsel and give it to him. He offers it to Judas. Judas takes it, symbolically acknowledging that he's going to betray Jesus. Look what happens next. This is verse 27. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. So Satan now is kind of hovering around trying to make his move because he believes if he kills Jesus, he's going to win, which certainly proves that Satan's not all-knowing. Listen to what happens next. Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Who is Jesus speaking to? I used to think it was Judas too. Follow the rules of English grammar. There's a personal pronoun. Jesus said to him, when there's a personal pronoun, in order to figure out who him is, you have to refer to what's called the antecedent or the last person named. The last person named isn't Judas. It's Satan. I think Jesus watched Satan take possession of Judas, looked right at him and said, what you do, do quickly. Because Judas gets up and leaves. And we won't see Judas again until he comes back with the mob. And quite frankly, the disciples were clueless. They had no idea what was going on, and they thought Judas left to buy more food. And so Jesus likely would have gone back to the table and continued the traditional teaching on the bitter herbs, which are that the bitter herbs represent the bitterness the children of Israel endured as slaves in Egypt. Everybody would have taken a piece of the unleavened bread, dipped it in the bitter mixture. Now it's supposed to bring a tear to your eye and uh, it smells quite potent. And so they would all take it and there's a prayer uh, that would be recited. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kitshanu b'mitzvot tzavetzivanu al achilat moror. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us and commanded us concerning the eating of the bitter herbs, and then everybody would take and eat. And you definitely don't want this to hang around your mouth. So that's the bitter herbs. The next element 
is the sweet mixture. The sweet mixture is called haroseth, which is supposed to resemble mortar. The children of Israel as slaves in Egypt were the builders. And they would build these, these cities of the pharaohs by making bricks out of mud and straw. And they, the way they would do that, they would likely get the guys with the big feet like me, and they'd have to stand in these mud pits all day, stomping the mud and the straw together. Can you imagine how horrible that would have been? And then the mixture would be placed in molds, the molds out in the sun to dry, and that's how they made the bricks. Now, this is a very sweet mixture. It's made with apples, grape juice, honey, uh, walnuts, and cinnamon. Why would something so difficult, the, the life of slaves in Egypt, and the Egyptians were called strict taskmasters, why would something so difficult be so sweet tasting? The answer is, in the midst of the difficulties of their lives as slaves, the children of Israel had the promise of God. God promised deliverance, and they knew that their deliverance was at hand, and therefore they had the promise of God that left a sweet taste in their mouths. And for us as believers, New Testament believers, the application obviously is pretty clear. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulation. Sometimes life is hard. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so the promises of God should always leave a sweet taste in your mouth. And so what happens next? There's actually no prayer for this one. Everybody would take and eat the sweet mixture. The next element is a hard-boiled egg, a brown egg. And uh, the egg represents the sacrifices, the sacrificial system. Now, the reason the egg represents the sacrificial system is really twofold. Number one, the sacrificial system gave the Israelites life, gave them right relationship with God. And so uh, the egg is a beautiful picture of life, but in addition to that, secondly, anybody here grow up on a farm with chickens? How often would a healthy hen lay an egg? Every day. Every day. And so the sacrifices were a daily occurrence. Day in, day, out, day, night, day in, day out, there was this constant sacrificing of animals. To the point that if you were an Israelite living near the temple in Jerusalem, there would be a stench in the air, a stench of death and burning flesh and all of those things intended to invoke in one sense is how much God abhors sin. So if you, let's just assume that you committed a sin and you wanted to take care of it and not wait for the day of atonement when all sins were taken care of once a year, you would have to take a prescribed animal to the priest in Jerusalem at the temple. Let's say a little goat. You bring this goat to the priest, he takes it from you, binds its legs, holds it real tight, and you are instructed to place your right hand on the animal's head. And doing that, then confess that sin. So the sin now is transferred from you onto that little animal. That little animal is now bearing your sin. He's your sin bearer. And then the priest takes out a knife, a very sharp knife. But he doesn't do the killing. He puts the knife in your free hand and you're instructed to cut the animal's throat so that it's going to bleed out and die a horrible, brutal exercise intended to show God's, God's abhorrence for sin, but also to point people forward. Because when Jesus died on that bloody Roman cross, he was the final sacrifice. He fulfilled that sacrificial system. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that's what we remember with the egg. And then this would not have been at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, they would have had uh, a lamb sacrificed at the temple, but the temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD by the Romans. And so traditionally now, at every Passover, is a shank bone of a lamb as a reminder that the temple is no longer standing and the lamb is no longer slain. That's the reminder 
of that shank bone. So this would end the first part of the Passover, and then we would have a full meal. Beginning with soup, we would have something called matzo ball soup. How many of you have ever had matzo ball soup? More than I expected. Good. So the matzo ball soup would be made in a chicken stock. The matzo, the matzo balls would be made out of matzo meal, like a matzo flour, and made into little dumplings. And if it was done right, those little dumplings would float real nicely on top of the soup, take on the chicken flavor. And as it's cooking, you could just take a breath and smell that incredible smell. So use your imaginations. How many of you smell in that matzo ball soup? So while we're, while we're smelling the matzo ball soup, I want to talk a little bit about Chosen People Ministries. So you could, you could continue eating. You don't have to stop eating. Chosen People Ministries is the oldest and largest Jewish ministry, ministry to the Jewish people in the world. We were founded by a Hungarian rabbi in the year 1894. And uh, we are now in 20 countries around the world, making up the vast majority of the Jewish population in the world. And as you can imagine, in the midst of everything, we are very, very busy in the Ukraine uh, doing ministry there. So what I'd like you to do, you should have all received one of these brochures. Uh, if you haven't received one, could you put your hand up? We'll get the ushers to give them out. So keep your hands up, because we're going to do something together, and we need everyone to have one. So while you are all waiting to get the brochures, I want to just tell you about what, something that we were, were planning to do. Uh, you'll see that there's going to be uh, an involvement card as part of the brochure. And uh, what we'd like to do, if you would commit to praying for our ministry, we're located in southeastern Florida in Palm Beach County, which is one of the largest Jewish populations in the country. There's almost three quarters of a million Jewish people in southeastern Florida. We would like to give you, as, just f as a thank you for committing to pray for our ministry, there's no financial attachment to it, just a commitment to pray. Uh, what we think is our most effective evangelistic resource called Isaiah 53 Explained. And this is basically, uh, you heard me read from Isaiah 53. It's the clearest presentation in the gospel from the Old Testament. And to share with a Jewish person, you can't take them down the, the Roman road, which is the New Testament, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. What happens next? You will be saved. It's a great way to take a person to the gospel. Except Jewish people don't believe that's the Bible. So instead you have to take them not on the Roman road, but on the Isaiah trail. And this is a great way to do that. So we're offering this as just as a thank you if you're willing to pray for our ministry. So here's what I'd like to do now. Everybody should have one of these. Uh, hold it up so I could see everybody has it. We're going to do an ancient Jewish tradition together. So would you all like to do an ancient Jewish tradition with me? I can't hear you. Okay. It's called the tearing of the brochure. It's a very ancient tradition. Here's what I'd like you to do. Don't tear it. Fold it a few times on the perforation. And then at the count of three, we're going to tear this together. And if you do this right, it will make this really neat sound, like the rushing wind of the Holy Spirit. You all ready? Count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Not bad. A little slow, but that's OK. This is for you to keep. This is an involvement card for you to fill out. And as I said, if you fill this out and bring it to the book table in the back, uh, while we still have copies, so you're going to have to be quick, um, this will get you a, a free copy of the Isaiah 53 Explained. Additionally, on the book table is uh, this book. A lot of times people say, is this Passover uh, written out? And the answer is yes. What I'm doing here is a very abrived, abridged edition. Uh, so the Passover will take, with the meal, 
probably close to three hours. Uh, but uh, this is a way for you to celebrate Passover with your family, and Passover is really family time. And then this is a book written by staff at Chosen People Ministries. I have a chapter in it uh, on the parallel between Exodus 12 and John 12. Uh, but this is a really deep study of the Feast of Passover and seeing how it so beautifully points to the Lord. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, to pick that up. Then I have two books that I've written. One is on a commentary on Romans 9, 10, and 11 called The Heart of the Apostle. That portion of Romans is critical to understanding Paul's heart as well as God's plan for Israel's future. And then this is a brand new book that I just finished the end of last year called The Lord is My Shepherd, Dianu. And Dianu is a, a, a word that's commonly used at Passover time, talking about all the blessings of God. If he only did one, that would be enough. But my whole premise is when we understand our relationship with the Lord, that should be enough. And that should be enough to take us through whatever the Lord has in store for us. And I wrote this really during the, in the middle of the pandemic. So this is a way to understand God's way of bringing us to contentment. And that, so that's a brand new book. And then how many of you have heard of Joel Rosenberg? Joel's a, also a Jewish believer. He's a novelist primarily, but he's written some nonfiction books. And this is his latest nonfiction book called Enemies and Allies. And he goes into detail of, of the negotiations between Israel's former enemies and Israel and how they're now allies and uh, President Trump's involvement with that and all of that. So uh, we have three copies of this book in the back and I would encourage you, if you're interested in getting a little bit of recent history, this is a great book to learn about uh, that time in history. So uh, again, fill those cards out, bring them to the back table and we'll get you a, a copy of the Isaiah 53 explained. So now we're going to finish up. How'd you enjoy the meal? <laughs> you know, besides matzo ball soup, traditionally Jewish people do not have lamb on Passover. Again, the reason being because the temple is destroyed, the, the Passover lambs are no longer sacrificed. So a traditional Jewish Passover meal might be uh, chicken breast, it might be brisket, it might be turkey, it certainly won't be eel. Uh, and it likely wouldn't be lamb, although some Jewish people from the Mediterranean era still have lamb. But uh, the bread is taken out, and I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is typically read when a church celebrates communion. And this is Paul, and he, he says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Notice, not daytime da Vinci, but nighttime. And when he had given thanks, there's a beautiful Hebrew prayer uh, that he would have prayed, and that prayer is, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olom, ha'motzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has brought forth bread from the earth. Now notice the difference in the prayer. The fruit of the vine is created. The bread is not created, it's brought forth because Jesus is speaking about himself. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus and bread are always connected. In fact, where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem, which is called in Hebrew, Beit Lechem, the house of bread. So when Jesus thanks the Lord for bringing forth bread from the earth. He's talking about himself. It said, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body. Think about this. The second of the three in one, unleavened, representing sinlessness, striped, pierced, broken, wrapped, buried, resurrected. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me and everybody would have taken of the afikomen. We're up to the third cup. And I told you I'd quiz you on this. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. Good. Now you should be thinking, well, how does he know it's that bread for certain that, that Jesus took? Listen to this. 
This is verse 25. In the same way or in the same manner, he took the cup also after supper. So he took the bread after supper, which is the afikomen. Now he takes the cup after supper, which is the cup of redemption, the third cup. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Everybody would have taken the cup of redemption. And notice Judas isn't, isn't present for this. And they all would have recited that prayer. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei peri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the creator of the fruit of the vine. Everybody say amen. amen. If you're following along, turn to Matthew chapter 26. Verse 27 is Matthew's account of the third cup. It says, when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But here's what I want you to hear. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And so what's Matthew telling us? Jesus drinks the third cup but he doesn't drink the fourth cup because of the promise attached to it. Remember I said, there's a promise attached to it. I will take you to be my people. The fourth cup will not be fulfilled until Jesus' second coming. He says, I will drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the question for you, and we're gonna take a little poll. How many of you believe that since Jesus didn't drink it, we, it's okay for us to drink it? Raise your hand. How many of you think we shouldn't take the fourth cup? Raise your hand. How many of you are thinking, I have no intention of raising my hand? <laughs> the answer is we should. We do take the fourth cup as a cup of praise, not because it's fulfilled, but because we've inaugurated it. As New Testament, New Covenant believers, we have inaugurated this fourth cup, this cup of praise, as a reminder that God is no longer dealing with the world through Israel, That'll happen in the future, but instead is dealing with the world through the church, Israel and the nations, Jew and Gentile, one in the Messiah. Amen? So this last cup, the cup of praise, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, borei peri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the creator of the fruit of the vine. Everybody say amen. amen. And we drink the fourth cup. We have one more thing to do and we're done. This nice place setting here with this golden chalice is the cup of Elijah. Because you see the tradition is that Elijah has to come to announce the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus tells us that if Israel would have believed the first time he came, that John the Baptist would have fulfilled that coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. But because they didn't accept him as the King Messiah, we look to future fulfillment. Many scholars believe that Elijah will be one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. But the tradition in the Jewish home at the Jewish Passover is to see if Elijah is waiting to come in. So I was about seven years old. We had a family Passover over my uncle's house. He lived in this, on the second floor of a two-family home in Brooklyn and had home my whole extended family. And here we are, and he says to me, I need you to go and see if Elijah's waiting to come in. I said, okay. And he says, but you need to understand a couple of things. Elijah's been dead for 3,000 years. And he described him sort of as a combination of a mummy and a zombie. And he said he'll be very hungry. So if he's there, you're gonna wanna make sure you get out of his way, because he's gonna come in. So now, I had to go down this very dank smelling dark stairwell to see if this zombie mummy was waiting, waiting to come in. So I'm slowly walking down the steps. And as I'm doing it, 
I'm saying, please don't be there, please don't be there, please don't be there. And I got down to the front door and I opened up and I very timidly kind of peeked out and exhaled. There was nobody there. So I went back to my uncle thinking he's gonna say something funny because that's, that was his personality. He was always joking. And I said to him, there's nobody there. But instead he got real serious. And he looked at me and in an almost melancholy way said to me, maybe next year in Jerusalem. Because you see the tradition is, in order for the Messiah to come, Elijah has to be there. And if Elijah's not there, then we gotta wait till next Passover. And that should break your heart. Because Jewish people around the world are waiting for a Messiah who's already come, who's died for their sins, and who's coming again. So for us as believers in Jesus, next year in Jerusalem is a shout of celebration. It reminds us that we're gonna spend eternity with him when he establishes his kingdom on the throne of David, reigning in Jerusalem, we're gonna reign with him. That's some of our rewards as believers. So I'd like to teach you next year in Jerusalem, first in Hebrew. So would you like to learn a little Hebrew phrase? Would you? Okay. And so this is next year in Jerusalem in Hebrew. So the first word is Lashana. Second word, Haba'ah. And the third word, a little harder, Beerushalayim. Okay, let's try it together. Lashana, Haba'ah, Beerushalayim. A little faster. Lashana, Haba'ah, Beerushalayim. Now you. Okay. We're going to do next year in Jerusalem to conclude the presentation. Uh, we want to do it in English, but I want to hear some excitement. Does it excite you that you're going to spend eternity with Jesus? Amen. Okay. So, at the count of three, next year in Jerusalem in English, with some excitement, with some gusto. Ready? One, two, three. Pastor, what do you think? I don't, that didn't sound excited enough to me. Okay, come on. You, you, when I said a shout, you screamed and yelled. You're talking about spending eternity with Jesus. Let me hear it. The count of three. One, two, three. Next year. Amen, amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for this picture of redemption that we are left with to celebrate redemption by the blood of the Lamb. And thank you that the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world has come, has died, has been resurrected, and is coming again, and we await his soon coming. But Lord, uh, we're burdened by those we love who don't know you. We think of the fact that only by personally applying the blood of the Lamb uh, to our hearts can we truly have eternal life. So I pray if there's anyone here who needs to do that, that you would be speaking to their hearts even now. And Lord, we lift up our families, our unsaved loved ones. We pray that you would work in their hearts and turn them to you. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. And we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.